Welcome everyone to the Australian Microsoft 365 Adoption User Group for April. Uh, we're now well over the seven year mark running the running the user group. So I do appreciate those that are familiar faces that keep coming back again and again. Um, it certainly is noted and thank you for um, keep going for keeping going on the journey with me. I have placed into our chat some of the links here for you to be able to support you to come back around and see the presentation again. So that is all available under, under chat. I've pinned it as well to the top of the chat so that you can find it again. So this presentation is, uh, is there as a link for you. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting from today and pay our respects to past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders peoples who are attending with me today. In terms of code of conduct, I ask that we be welcoming and open to all questions and viewpoints, that we're kind and understanding in regards to our differences. Some will have different questions to other, depending on how tech technologically challenged or advanced that we are. Uh, in chat, I ask that we please use um, respectful um, text in uh, and pictures and GIFs in our chat as we're going, so we consider it for all. So I am Kirsty McGraw. I am adoption consultant from On Point Solutions. I look after all employee experience and work closely with other clients. So what have I been up to? I always give the, you know, what have I been up to lately? You know, message along the way. It's been a lot happening. I have been on the road for the last, you know, couple of months right around Australia. So I seem to be permanently at the airport and looking at the views of planes. Um, I also went to the Rod Stewart, Cindy Lauper and John Stevens concert just last week, which had a ball. It was so much fun. Um, and to see them so, you know, energetic and having a ball was really good. And my grandson, we were cake making for my niece. They are in the middle there. They are um, an and they are uh, an inter interesting individual, adore them dearly, but they screamed their candles out. So it's not blowing them out. You've got to scream every candle out. <laughs> It was a lot of closing the closing the ears. Um, and my son finished his paramedical science degree and is starting in New South Wales ambulance. So we're very proud of him. That was at the start of his journey, all fresh faced, and he's now on the other end of it. So that's kind of what we've been up to. And I've been moving my daughter in her house into a into a new unit. So apart from travelling and and moving house, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I said toothpicks for eyes. And I've been working outside of work hours till kind of midnight and early hours to get our presentation ready for you. Let's go in. I'm going to start. I've swapped over in terms of the guest speaker. I'm putting them at the beginning rather than towards the end for you all so that you can hang around if the uh, update take a little longer. So, Andrea, I am going to now look at passing over to you. Andrea is the Product Marketing Manager for Beaver Learning at Microsoft. She's been there now for three years. And we're hopefully going to get in and she's going to walk us through a little bit more around the learning best practice and how we can sort of drive that widespread learning and adoption and then what's coming next around the product and I know that and I've got it in the presentation you recently did a blog in the in the Viva space so I'll, um, I'll put that in as a link if you don't have it in your presentation so I will let you take control now hand over I'll just stop sharing and you can take over thanks very much Andrea we really appreciate you being here with us Thank you so much for having me. I love this group. I um, had such a great response and good time presenting the last time I was invited. So I'm happy to be back here like maybe half a year later. And there's clearly been a ton of updates to the product since then. The industry has been changing so rapidly around employee learning. And so um, there's plenty of new information to talk about. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm Andrea Lum, working on Viva Learning at Microsoft. I'm a product marketing manager. And today I really want to focus our agenda on the first like stepping out into the overall trends that are happening in the employee learning space and also some tips and tricks on how to drive a modern learning strategy at your organization. And this could be with Viva Learning or also just in general best practices for really making learning a part of your company culture and something that's natural for employees. Uh, finally, we're going to talk more about Viva Learning and how that solution kind of answers a lot of these modern learning aspects that I talked about earlier. 
And also, I'm going to talk through some tips on driving a successful adoption for Viva Learning at your organization, if that's something that you are doing. Then again, I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Um, but if you have anything kind of throughout, feel free to raise your hand or pop something in chat, and I'm happy to answer too. I'll also read out for you. If anything comes in for, from chat, I'll help you with reading it out, Andrea. That's fantastic. Thank you. So let's step into some overall trends. We, we did a big research project at Microsoft just last fall called the Work Trends Index, and we found a ton of insight around what employees are actually asking for and needing in terms of their learning development and growth. Right off the bat, we saw that 76% of employees would stay longer at their company if they could benefit more from learning and development. So this is clearly a really large impact on your company and on employee retention. And I know that's a really hot topic right now as there is this trend in the economy of employee turnover and um, a lot of employees are kind of looking for a greater purpose in what they're doing at work. So with learning and development being such a huge factor for that retention, uh, we see a stark contrast in that most employees do not actually feel that their learning and development is being prioritized in their workplace. 67% of employees wish that they spent more time on professional learning and development. In our study, we also saw that 48% of all employees feel that neither their manager nor leadership at their company prioritize their own learning and development. So this speaks to a larger company culture gap where teams and managers don't emphasize growth and development as much as they should or in the right way. If you think about it day to day, how are you re receiving learning opportunities from work? The conversations that employees have with their managers or their colleagues are usually pretty work focused and they usually center around a work task at hand. Especially now that we're working remotely or hybrid, there's a lot less opportunity for what we call water cooler talk or just casual conversation. And that's usually where conversations around learning and development do pop up. That means that growth opportunities have to come up through other means. For most companies, the solution to this was investing in learning management systems and learning providers. And there's certainly a need to have these systems available. For one, a lot of industries have certain trainings that they require for compliance reasons, and these learning management systems allow them to set these trainings up and also to track completion records for them. But how many people are actually going out of their way to regularly search and discover learning courses in addition to their day-to-day -day jobs? My guess is not, not that many, and we saw that in our results from the study. So something else that's interesting is this 70-20-10 model of learning. And if you haven't heard of it before, it's, it's kind of this like tried and true model. Um, it's been around for a long time, and it states that people obtain 70% of their knowledge from on-the-job experiences, 20% of from interactions with other people, and 10% from formal learning. This implies that 90% of learning is actually happening informally. Does that mean that formal learning management systems and learning providers are doomed? Not exactly. Again, the solution is to find a way to leverage these experiential or social aspects of learning, along with more formal learning investments and trainings, in order to deliver learning in this innovative and modern way that fits what employees want. So in our studies, Microsoft surveyed a bunch of customers about what they really want and need from the corporate learning platforms. And these were the three main takeaways that we saw. One, this trend of learning in the flow of work. It's top of mind for a lot of companies and buyers out there when they're looking to modernize their learning system. Learning in the flow of work means bringing learning into the tools and the platforms that users are already spending their time. So for bringing learning content learning content and aspects of learning into collaboration platforms like Teams or Slack or even uh, things like Microsoft Office. That means learning comes up more organically for employees who are maybe working from home or working hybrid. Second, we want to simplify learning, especially for employees who already feel overwhelmed to find time to learn. It's not going to help if they have a bunch of different learning systems that are really complicated that their company offers to them that they can't really manage or navigate clearly. 
And so we want to aggregate learning content from a bunch of different sources into one central hub that's easy for the user to access and to navigate. Uh, a lot of that can happen through what we call API enabled partner integrations. So this learning hub can connect into a bunch of other learning providers or learning management systems through different APIs. Finally, something that's really important for the employees is to be getting personalized and relevant learning for their career growth. And so again, with this lack of time and lack of the ability to find ways to prioritize learning, employees want to be recommended content in an intelligent way that will help them to reach their learning and development goals. And so we want technology to be able to take AI or take signals from the employee in order, to, in order to suggest the right type of content and skills that they need to upskill and grow. So let's dive into what an actual modern learning strategy will look like, kind of listening to all of these trends that I talked about. One, we need to bring learning into the context of work activities. We saw in the study that people that see how learning applies directly to their work are 2.2 times as likely to engage in professional learning and development. We can tie this recent finding back to aspects of adult learning theory. The human brain starts changing at around 25 years old, and past that point, people learn and absorb information differently than they did when they grew up. In the workforce, most of who we're talking about are in the adult category, so it's crucial that we're playing into these aspects of adult learning theory. The primary pillar of adult learning theory is the importance of relevancy. So people should be able to apply what they're learning to their everyday lives and their work priorities. Otherwise, they can't understand why it's relevant. A couple ways, um, there are a couple ways that we can actually implement this concept of relevancy with learning at work. One is with project-based learning. So for example, workshopping a sales scenario for sales training, or acting out a manager scenario for a leadership training. This is just ways to kind of bring the scenario to life and they can really see how the learning content applies to their particular role. However, as in-person events are less common, companies have to find a way to deliver these online learning in the context and with real application. That's also where traditional learning management systems fall short because they usually sit separately from employees' data day-to-day -day activities and interactions. The other thing that we can do to lean into this theory of relevancy is to focus on micro-learning. So micro-learning micro is where employees can gain knowledge in small chunks at a time to meet a specific outcome. For example, maybe you're working on some data in Excel and maybe you don't particularly have a technical data background but Excel can actually recognize that you are trying to create something like a pivot table. And maybe from the, from the Excel window there, it'll actually recommend some really short learning courses on how to create a pivot table with Excel. That's a perfect, perfect example of micro learning. Notice that we are leveraging the, the relevancy model here. Uh, the modern learning solution will deliver these bite-sized pieces of learning in the time of need relevant to the employee's tasks. So moving on to the second main way that we can modernize our learning strategy, uh, and that is to make learning and development social. Social learning is a hugely important pillar of modern learning. People learn from observing others and seeing what behaviors get what outcomes. Receiving advice or a learning recommendation from a manager, mentor, or respective peer also means that there's this stamp of approval from a trusted source that it actually will be helpful. Additionally, when we learn in groups, which is also called cohort learning, we absorb the strengths, skills, and expertise, not just of the learning content, but also of the people that are taking that course with you. And with the explosion of the creator market, the concept of crowdsourcing to find the most relevant information is how a lot of people are finding information in their personal lives. For example, if you're searching the internet for an answer to a question or you're looking up a video on how to do something on YouTube, that's all leveraging the creator market. So why don't we extend this concept to workforce learning? Josh Burson sums it up nicely in his article. Uh, he titles it, How the Creator Market is Totally Disrupting Corporate Training. 
And there he says that employees value internally developed company specific content almost four times as much as vendor content. So how can companies adapt? It's time to tap into the knowledge of the people at your own organization, essentially giving space for employees at your company to become the creators of learning content and knowledge themselves. That means we have to provide the technology that will match employees with the right peers, experts, and conversations at their company. The challenge is that with traditional learning knowledge management systems, they sit separate from the channels that people use to collaborate and communicate with each other. So a modern learning solution will have to combine uh, learning with these social aspects like chat, meeting, and team and work group collaboration, which brings me to my next point. We must incorporate learning into the tools that people are already using at work. In our studies, we found that 61% of employees would be more engaged with learning if it was intertwined throughout their work and collaboration platforms. So we talked a little bit about learning in the flow of work earlier, uh, and there's a reason that that's starting to become popular, and that's something that a lot of companies are looking out for when they are investing in a learning system. By bringing aspects of employee learning in, and development into the work and collaboration tools, it adds relevancy naturally. Um, because you can see the application of that learning as it's happening right in the work platform itself. So to bring this to light, um, I'm going to lay out a scenario. Picture, picture a manager who's on a call with her team member. The manager is assigning a new kind of project to the team member that they've never really done before, and they're hoping that this will help them to grow and advance in their skills. The manager can share a few learning courses right in the chat of the meeting to help the employee get onboarded and upskilled to the, new, to the new project. And this all happens in the same platform without anyone having to leave the meeting itself. That's a perfect example of learning in the flow of work. Most importantly, intertwining learning with these work tools eliminates barriers to accessing and discovering learning. So we found in our studies that 52% of people consider the lack of time to be a top barrier to learning. Bringing relevant learning to where people are working means that they aren't wasting any time navigating to a separate platform or browsing through cluttered content libraries that companies may offer. So moving on to an example of a real product that incorporates all of these modern aspects of learning. Here at Microsoft, we built Microsoft Viva as this new kind of employee experience solution um, and we kind of had all of this in mind when we were building Viva Learning. Viva Learning is unique because it was built not only as a learning so solution, but also as part of Microsoft's overall employee experience suite, which means that Viva Learning's interface and its capabilities are centered right around the employee's wants and needs, rather than a more traditional learning system. Viva Learning actually does connect with formal learning providers and formal learning systems, to bring these formal aspects of learning into the flow of work. And it also has other features like a SharePoint integration, which allows employees to upload their own content into Viva Learning itself. So we're tapping into not only uh, the formalized parts of learning, but also the social aspects of learning and the crowdsourcing aspect, um, because again, employees can bring their custom generated content or from the company into a formal learning uh, platform. And again, Viva Learning is an app that's specifically built for Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365. So it's really deeply integrated into a large collaboration and communication platform. So we've already rolled out Viva Learning to um, both Microsoft and a handful of initial customers, and we've seen a huge impact in all of our customers in actually increasing the engagement of learning. For example, Music Tribe was one of our first customers and they saw an 80% increase in the number of employees that are actively engaging with learning content after launching Viva Learning. So that's a huge number and it's a huge impact and we really think that this new method and this new aspect of learning in the flow of work um, is actually working to drive 
culture of learning and to drive engagement. So diving a little more here into the actual Viva Learning app and what its features are, uh, we kind of have three main pillars of features for the app itself. So first off, you can access the Viva Learning app through Microsoft Teams on desktop, and also there's a mobile app in the Microsoft Teams mobile app. Um, you can also access aspects of Viva Learning throughout Microsoft 365. For example, if you search something in SharePoint or office.com or even Bing for work, you'll actually see learning results pop up that are related to your search if you have Viva Learning enabled. So one of the greatest things of Viva Learning is that because it's built into Microsoft Teams, um, it is inherently social. So you can share learning content that is connected to Viva Learning in a Teams message or chat. Um, you can also create a collaborative learning tab in any Teams channel that you have. So that kind of creates this cohort learning aspect from within Microsoft Teams. You could also send a recommendation to someone else. Um, and that's more of a formalized way to share learning with someone because you, you can actually track reported completion progress on that learning that you've recommended to. So everything is peer to peer, it's social. Um, again, you're not just getting recommendations from this engine that some admin has set up for you like most learning management systems work. You're actually getting personalized recommendations from your colleagues and coworkers who know you best. Second, something that I think is really cool is there are a ton of really great ways that Viva Learning helps you to prioritize learning for yourself and also to personalize your experience. One of them is by creating a learning collection. And so learning collections and learning paths are new features to Viva Learning. We just launched them earlier this calendar year. And you can create a collection of any learning content from formal learning content to, um, again, user generated uh, company content that's connected through SharePoint. And once you have that collection, you can either keep it for yourself to manage your own learning, or you can actually share it or recommend it to others too. So if you're a manager, you can create a learning collection of relevant content for your team and then recommend that out to them. Another really great feature that I love is the add to calendar feature. I often tell myself in my head that I'm gonna complete a learning or a training and then when it gets down to it, it's Friday and I'm working on something else and I completely forget that I, I was trying to set aside time to focus on my development. Viva Learning makes it easy. If you actually go into a learning course in Viva Learning, you can just select the add to calendar button and it'll actually suggest times based on your calendar availability that you can schedule that learning course for. And what it does is it blocks out a dedicated block of time um, to complete that course. It'll take into account how long the course is, so the actual course duration, and it'll add it directly to your calendar. Once it's on your calendar, you can click into the calendar invite or event, and it links you directly to the course in Viva Learning. So that for me has been a game changer. <laughs> I haven't missed any any trainings or any you know, personal learning days because I've had them blocked out on my calendar for me. Finally, getting personalized le learning recommendations are really cool. So you can see in this GIF in this slide, this is an example of what we have. Um, Viva Learning will suggest learning courses based on interests that you pick out for yourself. And um, you can kind of refresh that regularly. Again, because this is all sitting in Viva or inside of Microsoft Teams, which I'm in daily. Um, it's a really easy way to get inspired and to, to discover new content and new skills um, regularly in my flow of work because I'm opening Microsoft Teams all the time and I don't have to step into a separate platform to see new recommendations or to discover new courses. And then I just want to point out some more evidence points that we found um, I know right now the economic environment is a little tough and a lot of companies and customers of ours are really trying to evaluate what investments are going to make the biggest impact on their company. We conducted this total economic impact study with Forrester uh, last fall actually, where we evaluated a group of our initial customers um, and followed them through their rollout and adoption of the Viva Suite. As, long, or as well as tracking the actual impact and monetary impact that that had in their companies. We saw that after rolling out the Viva Suite, they saw 
um, a reduction in speed to full productivity via accelerated onboarding. Uh, and Viva Learning is a really large factor in accelerating that onboarding for them. There's also a 20% reduction in, in employee attrition with Viva. So again, kind of hitting on that employee retention part, uh, Viva is really, really showing impact in that aspect for our customers. And I uh, also want to share some tips on driving a successful learning adoption at your company, um, both with Viva Learning, but also just with general learning practices to again show your employees that learning is their learning and development is something that's a priority uh, to leadership and management, and that's something that your company is going to invest in for them. So the first step that I think is really important is identifying target scenarios of how your employees will be using Viva Learning or other learning products to achieve their goals. And these target scenarios should be creative. They should go outside of just things like completing required trainings on time or making sure we have X percent of, um, of required trainings done. Uh, because again, learning and development goes far beyond just required trainings. And so a couple scenarios that I just jot down here as examples, um, crowdsourcing learning content from across the company. There's a lot of knowledge loss in large companies especially, and with things like employees leaving and onboarding, there's also a lot of knowledge turnover when people do leave the company. And so being able to crowdsource learning content and knowledge really easily through the help of technology is something that is a hugely impactful scenario that we really want to make sure our learning solutions um, address. Another thing is fostering a team culture of learning. Again, learning should not be done in a silo and learning is best done when it's social or when it's something that you can you know, talk about with other colleagues and talk about with people that you trust. And so we want to enable our employees to um, learn socially and create these cohorts and really talk about learning regular, regularly in their day to day. Um, and that's something that uh, we want to be able to track when we are driving learning adoption. Some more tips on driving a learning culture. Um, one we've seen from our early customers that aligning department stakeholders across human resources, learning and development, and IT organizations are crucial for adopting learning successfully. So learning is not just about L&D, it's not just about HR. We really need buy-in from all these different groups if we are kind of rolling out this both technological and this more human or people aspect of the change. Two, it's really important to train from the top down so this culture of learning kind of trickles down throughout the company. And so we think that training leaders and managers on the concept of learning in the flow is really important. Again, shifting attitudes from learning being only for required trainings to being something that's part of the regular workday. Managers and executives should be able to talk to their employees and encourage them to regularly learn new skills in addition to just required trainings. Another thing that we can do is keep learning dynamic and relevant at our companies. So we need to make sure that content is constantly refreshed and relevant. We need to govern what learning content is out there and also make sure that everything that's available internally too is up to date and relevant to our company still. And then something else that I think is really helpful is continuing to advise employees on learning trends or opportunities and skills to look out for. In my organization at Microsoft, our VP of marketing actually sends out a monthly newsletter to everyone in the organization, um, letting us know what learning resources are available. Um, a lot of it will point to courses that are in Viva Learning and also just like virtual events that we can join or speakers that they have coming up. Um, those are really, really helpful again to just put learning top of mind for all of us. And then a handful of other recommended learning practices. These are not all from me, but we're actually, um, I've actually crowdsourced these best practices for learning from a bunch of our early customers. And these are something that they said that I think are really awesome. So I just wanted to share. Uh, one is setting a dedicated learning day at your company. For example, there's one day a month that's meeting free that 
employees can all dedicate to focusing on their personal growth. Two is setting up your company so employees actually book learning time as they do annual leave. So I know this requires some change in maybe your back-end booking system, so it's kind of an idea, but some of our customers are already doing this where you can, you have like a set number of days available for paid time off, and you also have a set number of days available for using as learning days or growth opportunities. This creates this hard book slot for learning and there's an agreement between employees and their managers that this is just as uninterruptible as taking their time off or vacation. Another way to drive, uh, to drive a culture of learning is to establish mentor sessions where designated people will get to research and present on certain learning needs at the company and share those out with everyone else. I think this is really important, um, showing that leadership is personally committed to their own learning. So again, we're looking into that trickle down theory where we're seeing managers and leaders investing in their personal growth and taking time away from work to do that. And we're gonna feel more comfortable doing that ourselves. So at things like a town hall or a company meeting, have leaders share examples of how they are dedicating their time and their focus to their own personal development. Hopefully that sparks inspiration for the other employees at your company. And then finally, if your company uses OKRs or any goal or KPI tracking process to measure results for each team, you can have the teams include a learning related goal. Um, and you can make that something that is required for a team. So um, as I set my, my KPIs for myself for this upcoming quarter, let's say. Um, I will have to have one of those be a learning and development related KPI, something like taking two volunteering learning courses this semester outside of what my required trainings would say. So that's all I have for you in terms of content. Um, thank you again for listening. And yeah, I think we have uh, some time left, so I'm happy to answer questions or um, also, hear what you all are doing at your companies around learning and, and, and development. See, see, we've more just had comments along the way. Um, is the presentation, we've been through the presentation, Andrea, just uh, for everyone, if that's possible? Is the, oh, sorry, say that again. The presentation availability for everyone will be something that usually comes up as a, as a question. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to make these to share these slides out afterwards. So I'll just export them and um, I can share them with Christy, maybe to share with this group. Yeah, Matthew. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Really appreciate your insights there. That's fantastic. Just a question around uh, helping people discover the unknown unknowns. Right, so if I'm working in the flow and I'm getting fed training potentially in the flow of what I'm doing, you know, that's still in the known known space. So, you know, surfacing surfacing information in a curated way to people about topics they need to know about but have no idea to ask about. Yeah, yeah. And um, you're totally right. I think that's like a little bit different from that micro learning concept that I was talking earlier. Um, so I see it as two ways to kind of get this completely new type of information. One, and how I've usually gotten it, is from peers, mentors, colleagues, and managers of mine. Um, they're, they may be a step or two ahead of me in their careers and their lives, and they may know some gaps that I am not aware of. And so I think the peer recommendation is really powerful for that. Um, and then the second is more, more artificial intelligence in some of these learning systems to actually recommend new skills, new content um, that goes outside of, like, we call it like a Netflix type recommendation. So learning from your past behavior to suggest future content. Um, but with, with artificial intelligence kind of coming into a lot of these recommendation systems, it should go beyond just past behavior and recommending content based on that. Um, and I don't wanna give too much away, but like we are working on building this intelligence engine in Viva Learning as well. Um, you're gonna start to see it for, uh, a couple of our Viva products actually. And yeah, it, it really should, it really should talk to what you're talking about. Well, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Thanks for the question. Do we have any other questions? Yes, Beth, you got another one? <laughs> <laughs> Just a follow up question. You may have answered it already, but um, one of the challenges uh, with um, LinkedIn Learning, Viva Learning and all these other tools is the the availability of information and information overload. So effective ways to curate to the relevant. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Again, I think the peer recommendation is really good. Like any any way that I could get a personalized recommendation that takes more effort than just a system just spewing out content at me. So for me, top priority is getting a recommendation from a peer or manager. That's probably going to be the most relevant to what I'm working on. Um, second to that, as our intelligence is improving, hopefully it will get a little bit more targeted in content. Um, and then also with some of the newer features in Viva Learning, like learning collections and learning pads, those are created and meant to be kind of more targeted groups of um, learning content based on role or based on industry or line of business. So now we're able to recommend things like that to our employees rather than just, you know, an, an entire library, for example. And so to follow up on that, thanks for that. Um, then uh, is is there is Viva Learning and the AI behind Microsoft system able to look at the results that the learning has on the end user? So, hey, we learned this skill in this particular application and the result was you seem to be spending less time here. Um, is it yeah, yeah, we're not quite there yet with some of the more intelligent AI stuff that we're building in. That will be a possibility in the future. Um, the one thing that Viva Learning doesn't do right now is to track like individual learner data just because that gets into privacy issues. So. As we are coming out with reporting and insights for Viva Learning, it'll be more aggregate data and aggregate insights. For example, these are the skills that our employees as a whole are kind of leaning into and consuming more of. This is the type of content they're consuming, and these are the providers that they are most gravitating towards. I think there's still some real value in that. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that, Matthew. And half our battle is being able to direct people, redirect or know how they're actually using it to justify in terms of return on investment. Um, and Gabrielle has asked, uh, you know, assuming you're already subscribed to any learning content provider, um, some of them already have tracking recommendation and features that overlap with Viva Learning Premium. Uh, what would be the business case for Viva Learning in that case? You know, I understand that if you have many sources, Viva Learning acts as a you know hub aggregator, but with only having one, does it make sense for Viva? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And the key differentiator and value for Viva Learning there is to bring all that into the flow of work in a super native and integrated way. So yes, you can subscribe to a bunch of learning providers and learning management systems and have all these content libraries available to your employees. But realistically, how many of them are going into those platforms and, and navigating the different reporting structures there or the different um, interfaces on separate platforms? A lot of people are pretty overwhelmed already with keeping up to their day-to-day -day work. And so as those systems integrate with the Viva Learning app, it also brings them into things like Teams Chat, Teams Channel Tabs. Um, the Viva Learning app itself sits inside of Microsoft Teams so they can access all of those really cool features from the connected learning providers within Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365. Um, that's a true value there. And we see... We see Viva Learning less as a competition with other learning providers and more as something that will increase the return on investment that you're already making for a lot of those other platforms. Okay. okay. Any other questions? These have been great questions. Really just hitting the nail on the head. Yeah. All that. Um, uh, yeah, look, I mean, I know that um, Viva Learning has certainly gone on a journey in regards to being that aggregator and pulling information in from, uh, you know, a, a lot of adults and learning providers and it's extending it. I think it's more, we've got, we see an awful lot where it's more of those, uh, that open source side of it, where we've got a lot of different types of learning providers doing different things and how do we plug that in and have as an interface with Viva Learning 
to be able to interact and surface that content to plug in and do bookmarking and put on calendars. And so I do see a little bit of that too. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully the like the true extent open platform, extensible platform should be more available now, now that we've released the APIs in Viva Learning. Mm. And that's allowing all of our customers and partners to just build any connection with any provider learning management system to Viva Learning. So yeah. it shows again that our strategy is to be fully open, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know it was certainly a big step. I know once that happened, it made it a little bit um uh, a little bit more palatable, I think, for for a lot of organisations as that aggregator, because often we do have a lot of places. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Right, thanks very much for that, Andrea. I do really appreciate you coming back and speaking with the team. I know it's uh, late there at night, be what, nearly probably quarter past eight or so by now for you. So we'll, um, we'll let you go. Thank you for coming in, and I will swap over to presenting the what's new in adoption and 365. Okay. Let me just bring it in. Okay, share. Okay. Didn't want to allow me to present in. I was saying it wasn't saved, but all good. So. I prefer to have it where I bring it in with PowerPoint Live just purely because then you can click on all of the links. But it was saying to save. Okay. Mm -mm. Just making some adjustments now that it wouldn't do. Oh. Right. Okay. You should hopefully be able to see the screen and I'll just change over now the spotlighting. Okay. So what's new to adoption? Boy, hasn't there been a lot that's actually been happening over the last month in terms of announcements of things that have come out from Microsoft, without a doubt, um, and, and trying to get your head around some of it. I know it can be really difficult. I've got some links in here to be able to help and support you. Uh, the main core components in terms of what's new. Um, I'm actually going to be speaking this evening at the Adelaide Microsoft 365 user group. It is hybrid. So if you would like to come along, I put in chat the link link in chat uh, for the presentation. So unfortunately, it won't allow me to do PowerPoint Live at the moment. But, you know, in their cross fingers, you'll be able to click on the uh, clip on the link if you would like to join and see. I'm presenting on a real life scenario of Change Champions program built, designed and been executed over the last sort of uh, six to eight months, if you want to have a look how that actually went. Um, the, uh, pr the presentation and the recording, as always, will be put up on our on my uh, YouTube channel, so the Microsoft 365 Adoption YouTube channel. You can go to aka.ms forward slash m365 adoption and you'll be able to see it when I send it live. I'll also put it into chat in here. There is now 75 videos in the Club Talk that I have been involved in. Um, we're always answering lots of great questions in there and wherever I can, I'll link it back even in this presentation if I think it's something that we've already discussed and is relevant. The latest Champs calls has all gone up. The recent one in March has some great information in. I'd highly recommend going in and downloading the presentations, talking about the new Teams app, for example. Um, there's a, uh, a, a great download from Alana that uh, will help out. So a few things in terms of the community type work and then the Champion program. So. I go and get a lot of my release notes from the Microsoft Adoption site. You can click on what's new and it has all its release notes there. The new adoption guides have gone live. So there is a few new versions that have gone up for Viva Learning, Insights, Connections and Engage. There are four new that are now on there. So the Viva Engage also has that PowerPoint presentation. So this is that adoption guide. Um, some really great information in there around adoption for 
you know, it used to be Yammer, of course, don't forget. Now it's now Viva and Go. So what's that process look like? Um, and there's lots of awesome information in there to help and support as, an, as a guide. Now that uh, in resources piece, so they've got a rebranding toolkit, which also includes some of this information. You can go in and download that branding, which got all the logo and templates and all things like communication plans and some really great stuff in there when it comes to the uh, rollout of Beaver Engage inside your organisation or the update around the branding is there as well. Uh, go in, you can track, I've put all the different resources there for you. If you aren't sure in terms of the Viva suite, what that costing actually looks like, because we've been talking a little bit about Viva in Australia. So this is the Australian costing is 1240 per user per month. I have been asked this quite a bit lately, so I thought I might just drop it in for you so you have a bit of an understanding of what that cost looks like to be able to get all the different Viva um, components included. In WorkLab, there are some great guides in there. There are four in particular there under the WorkLab guides. Um, getting Hybrid Meeting Right has a presentation that you can actually download. The other ones are in there as PDFs. Uh, for Beaver Goals, it's actually got a guide in there, an adoption guide. It's about understanding the OKRs. And then over in the hub, there's a, you know, improving the business value around Viva Goals. So two links on here as to why you would actually use it if you've got to push it forward and um, and look at trying to even business cases around it. Okay. The latest newsletter has come out only a couple of days ago um, or about a month ago, but it was afterwards. You've got the Adoption Community Newsletter. Go in, have a little bit of a look and a read. There's always plenty there for us to go through. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is today is included in this anyway there's always updating on the podcasts and shows the blog there hasn't been an update to this particular blog since january but we'll keep an eye out on it for you community days there's lots that's coming out in the community days if there's a particular topic there are running all over the world in terms of community days if you want to get engaged and involved the latest um, news has come out for March from Modern Work Superheroes in there. You want to see kind of what's going on. It's a little bit like what I'm doing here. It's got uh, sort of less content there, but we'll help you out. So the Modern Work Superheroes also have their YouTube site, which they're putting information on all the time. Let's get into the what's new in 365. Um, I always think, oh, it seems to be, you know, fairly quiet. Look, it's quiet on the... Um, some of the newsletters that are coming out, like the SharePoint one didn't come out this time, so I don't have a lot on the SharePoint. However, in terms of new products that are hitting us, there's a lot there are updates to the products. In the what's coming when we go into our admin and we're starting to have a look at Message Centre, there's a, certainly a little bit in there. There was, I think, 93 updates over the last month of which I just distilled some of that down for you. So the new Bing. So why am I talking about the new Bing? Ultimately, because considering we're looking at the Microsoft 365, I think, you know, we need to understand that it has impacts in terms of flowing through where it flows through to. So a few things that I particularly liked was that new Bing image creator. So you can go, you know, um, show me a picture or create a picture that's what this with daisies and <laughs> you can create off the big image creator. So that then helps down into Office. But it, what I liked about the new Bing is the fact that it's now flowing through into the Windows environment, which is under our Microsoft 365 banner. So when you're going in and you're wanting to use as part of your start, and you're doing search, it's actually going to use the new environment when it comes to Microsoft Bing and the chat GPT side of it. So that's all now flowing in through to the desktop, which will impact our users from a desktop experience. Microsoft Copilot. Um, boy, hasn't this gone out and um, caused a little bit of a flutter. I've put in a couple of links that I think are of relevance. There's you know, there's certainly a lot of content out there, but I've tried to be quite clear around 
some of the core content that will actually support you. Um, one or two that I will recommend, if you're really not sure around what it is, and I'll show you a little bit in a minute, um, I've also put in some of the different topics, like if it's in OneNote, Outlook, and in Viva Engage, things that will help your end user if you want to talk to them about. So there's some short, sharp videos. Some are a little longer than others. Uh, so, you know, some can be up to sort of 10 minutes or more, but there are some shorter ones in there. Now, it's in testing at the moment with around about 20 customers. There is going to be more information coming out around pricing and details in the coming months. So the moment we've got some of that information, uh, I will then start to present it to you and help and support you on that. But Copilot, the one thing about Copilot, and it's the fact that you can have it and it plugs in, it's actually up on the ribbon. So on your home bar, you can go kick off Copilot. It will help you to create content. And I'll show you a bit more of how it does it in a minute. So, for example, we bring in Copilot. We start to type out, for example, I want to do a proposal. And what content do you want to draw from as a sort of aggregator across 365, drawing content to build out something like a proposal automatically for you based on your own internal type notes and documents? Now, so how does it do that? So Copilot actually brings all of the apps together and it uses what we class as a LLM, a large language model. So it kind of moves between them and goes, I want to use the language model. And then Microsoft Graph where it pulls your data. So if you've got a new starter, for example, you may not actually have content there to put things in context. So it might take a little bit of time to have content build up because it's based on your personal information that's sitting in repositories. So that's how it kind of pulls all this information together, uses the apps, and it's in you know, the good proportion of the apps to then start building and designing automatically for you some content and also fixing content up along the way as well. So you can, uh, you can then build and, and uh, fix it. Now, I do like this because it takes out some of the work of the mundane. So the mundane things so it kind of pre-builds and then you can customise and build off the back of it. Um, and there's some interesting data around it. If you haven't seen it, there is some videos on the introducing uh, Microsoft 365 Copilot across all of the various products and what it will actually look like to plug in and how it can help you as a bit of a scenario. So there's some really great. Yeah, it certainly is clearly the 21st century, without a doubt, going going pretty hard there as well, Lynn. Um, so just uh, it's quite impressive the way that it's going is kind of pulling from that sort of chat G GPT environment a little too. Now, there was some research. Now, why am I talking in the technical? Because this is on GitHub. So it was research around developers using it. I thought it was quite interesting because, um, you know, they had some developers go in and they did a bit of research around those that you know, did and didn't use it and how much faster it actually made them using Copilot to pre-build. I mean, we're talking here around about a nearly an hour and a half less in time from using Copilot to not. And they actually found off the back of it their satisfaction in their job when it came to happiness and productivity increased because it reduced down some of the mundane. It was a bit of an interesting research piece that you might want to have a look at because we you know, can talk about it. I'm sure there'll be more on the end user side of things as we go, but it was a good one. Yeah, it is rather impressive, isn't it? Okay. The next one, Microsoft Loop. Um, Loop has been in there. We were kind of using it in the OneDrive space. You could do it in chat. Um, you could do it through your OneDrive. There's sort of components here and there. Um, hasn't that kind of you know, imploded and gone a little bigger? Because now we're seeing it integrating and going right across. Okay, so what does that new loop app look like? And you might want to put it on your mobile phone so that you can start to get in and co-create when it comes to loop. And SharePoint then coming in as the storage platform for those loop app components. Now, we've got it both um, in pages and workspaces, and there's all the other stuff that was promised quite some time ago has been worked on. Um, I'm thinking I might even reach back out to Daryl. He presented for us. Um, Microsoft Loop in its kind of more beginning days. And I know he's the kind of the specialist across this space. He's become a bit of a global specialist and I might invite him in if it's something of interest on how to build. But in terms of Loop, 
in going to the loop page. So if you go to loop.microsoft.com, it does need to have some components enabled from an administrative you know, tenant side to kick it off and make it available to have things like loop workspaces up and running. But it can then be dropped in. What I do love is its integration right across all of our different types of applications. So for example, in Whiteboard and being able to drop in existing loop components into Teams and Outlook and Word and paste from all those various areas that you might actually create and drop it into something like your Whiteboard. So this is bringing in those loop components. And um, just so that you know, in terms of Whiteboard as well, it's got that whole new timer capability that's dropping in if you're actually logged in. Okay. When we look at the loop tasks, so tasks is then syncing because as you know, it's the fact that we were creating loop items in chat, the problem was it didn't have that integration flowing through into like Microsoft to do and or planner or the task app. Now it will actually have all that flow through so that we can keep up to speed of, of tasks. So it's got a lot more integration across the whole suite. Um, some of the features and functionality coming to loop, just so that you're aware, File extensions are actually going to change from .fluid to .loop because it was part of the Fluid framework. It's still part of the Fluid framework. However, it's going to have its own proper loop branding. So you'll see it there. If you're searching for it across OneDrive or SharePoint, it will be based on if you're looking at doing a search, you'd go star.loop and it would be whatever the name of the actual file is to be able to search it should you wish to find it. Um, it doesn't actually affect though the existing fluid file so it will still stay the same it's not going to rename them okay so you can continue to open and use the older versions it's not going to have a problem it's only the newly created ones that's going to use the new extension so it's not going to affect any of the links or the files or and there aren't any differences it's just that name swap out okay for moving forward Microsoft Teams, the new version of Microsoft Teams has been announced and flowing out there. Um, it is currently in preview. I am playing around with it. In fact, if I bring up Teams, let's go bring up Teams do, 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 in chat. I'll just let it, let's bring it over. So if you haven't actually seen it, because I know that there is a, a lot of tenants that, you know, may not be able to go and have a little bit of a look. So inside Teams, it's had a real colour change. So you can see these sort of colour changes. It's had a flip of the post. So the posts are now starting from the top and you're scrolling down instead of kind of the opposite. You'll also note in terms of starting a new post, it automatically goes straight to add a subject. So there's a few core things that I do really love as part of this. And not only that, but that tenant switching. So being able to swap around the tenants immediately in the drop down, and I can also be in a meeting and swap tenants. So that is a massive win for me in terms of being able to swap and move around. So a couple of cool things. There's lots of other stuff, but this is sort of a just to get you started as a bit of an idea, and we'll talk a bit more about it. So the online, they're doing an AMA in terms of the new teams. It's on April 13th at 9 a.m. Of course, that's specific time, so it'll be all hours of the morning for us. But if you wanted to join, you can go to the AKA MS forward slash um, teams tech community. I'm going to drop that down now. Let's come back here. Okay, so in terms of the new teams, we've already had a little bit of a look at it and a bit of a play, the new post format, the multi-tenant account and switching. So I've got a little bit more information in here for you to be able to come back and have a look at it. So you just add in another account and start to switch around. Okay. The new teams, the ebook that's actually come out, so there's interesting stats in there around how much faster it is and the processing memory in the back end, it's using 50% fewer resources than new Teams, which considering um, in Teams we're seeing it sometimes slowing or finding a little hard to get it with moving from one screen to another. We're seeing a little bit of kind of white screening. It takes a bit for it to sort of come up. The fact that it's actually uh, going to be speeding up to me is uh, really important. I do like that. There is an inside Microsoft Teams recording that's been done by Derek and Jeff around the new Teams where they're having a bit of a talk through what it looks like and the whys. It's not a demo of the environment, it's a discussion, but it's one that I do recommend. 
as part of the Inside Teams um, Season 7. Okay. If you want to have a look at the quick short video, it doesn't go for very long. You can go to have a look at what it looks like. It's a fancy, fancy little video there. It's a new feature with Teams. There are some new custom backgrounds that have actually come in. I do like the community submissions. There's some cool ones there in the community submissions that you might actually like in the, some of the newly added community submissions. The other one in terms of new to Teams is Avatar. Avatar is now, the avatars are coming out to you. It is in public preview at the moment. We did uh, ask me anything with Collab Talk around why would you actually use the Mesh avatar? And, uh, you know, it, these things can, of course, be turned on and off. I particularly like them from a certain perspective where we have a lot of people that might be, as we like to say, sort of neurospicy inside the business. And they, we find that those that are really shy and don't like being on video and or don't cope with the overload, they find that they work much better with the avatar flowing through. Um, I, we have seen some that um, don't particularly love it from a business context. Everyone is a little different, a little each to their own, but I do like the fact that it allows some people to finally feel that they can open up. So that, in my opinion, is a win. Thank you. The new speaker coach in Microsoft Teams meetings, then when it comes to the Teams meetings, speaker coach will now drop in those live insights in your Teams meeting and it will only be seen by you. However, you won't actually see it in your channel meetings or if you start a meet now option. Okay. Um, yeah, Sherry, I agree. The no feels Friday and you don't want to be on camera. <laughs> I'm doing my hair today, so I won't do a, uh, avatars. And also in the avatars, you can do automatic um, motion, like you can kind of do that type thing that you can just click it and it does it automatically for you. Some fun stuff as part of it. <laughs> Okay. Um, another one is video filters. They've all been flowing through. You may have seen them already. It's hit most uh, most tenants flowing through in terms of those video filters. Some will um, move, some won't. Some have got balloons coming up the screen and some can be distracting. It depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're coming from some social type perspectives, it puts a bit of personality in in terms of the video filters. So you can either do that when you're going into the meeting or once you join the meeting, either or. In terms of Teams chat, the Compose box and recent posts, this is in that new environment, is going to be moving to the top of the page. And then that way you'll be able to navigate a little bit um, a little bit easier. Hashtags are coming in and going to be referencing Viva topics. Um, there's going to be a more streamlined information pane. So that sits over on the right-hand side as part of this sort of new environment so that you can see a little bit more around the team. Pinning posts to make it a little easier and then also some simplified badging when it comes to unread activities. So these are all new features that are going to be flowing through. Mm -hmm. OneDrive inside Teams has had an updated file experience. So when you go on files, you do have your quick access when it comes to other Teams, but it's flowing first to OneDrive underneath files. So it's going to go and it looks a little bit like you did when you were online. So if you go into your browser and you went to OneDrive, it has your home, it has your files there, it has things that you've shared to make it a little easier to find things that are shared by you or to you. This one I do particularly like because it was always a real challenge in like chat, for example, where when you share a file, by default, it is OneDrive and trying to find it later on in Teams can be a little difficult. So surfacing that so you can see the shared with you or by you under OneDrive under files directly is a good one. You do have your downloads in there as well. So that hasn't changed. But another component now is the quick access. So you can come in and you can actually pin the quick access to SharePoint library so you can have and pick and choose which ones you want to have in there. So that's coming out by mid-April. Coming new to Teams soon is offline meetings in Microsoft Teams so that you can actually go in 
and in Teams calendar, when you go to create an event, so if it's in a personal appointment, so this is appointments, so it's appointments like lunch break slots or other type things, and you're trying to do it from in Teams, by default, it doesn't mean it's going to be an online Teams meeting, okay? So you can turn it off with the toggle so it's not actually a Teams meeting for an appointment, so it's offline. Reminder emails coming out now in terms of webinars. This is reserved for the Teams premium licenses. So you can have those automated reminders that come out and they're timely. You can set it and have it sent that one hour beforehand, for example, with the custom branding header and the webinar details and join link for just prior to. Okay. So in here, the what's coming as well. For example, I'm in right now the preview version of Teams. So it's actually changing. It used to have a P against your profile picture up the top if you were going into public preview. Now it has an EA, so it's early access instead of public preview, okay? Private, public. Green screening feature in Microsoft Teams. So you can actually use this with your virtual backgrounds and giving you a bit of an enhanced virtual background. Now, what you can do is after underneath your settings, you can come in and you can just flow through. I might even do a bit of a zoom in on the picture here for you. So you'll see here, you know, what's that background color? You can tell it what the background color actually is as part of the settings. So that way you can um, um, set up those features and functionality under the more button in your video effects. There's been some speaker view enhancements. So if you actually came in and you go click on the view button, there is speaker view. So there's a bit of a change in the way that it's actually working. It can then track the active speaker a little better. So it puts them primary on the stage. It's going to do video rendering at a higher resolution if you're the speaker. So it's noticing you're the speaker and does higher resolution and drops down your um, attendees effectively. Um, equal representation around audio and video for the participants. It's going to utilize the 16 by nine tiles so that it does a little bit different in terms of the space to be able to display things like those hand gestures with the hands and body language and a few other things, okay? So it is looking at um, a few different changes, so slight ones, but it will help around some of the video fatigue as well that we can sometimes might see. Um, task publishing. Now this one in particular, in terms of task publishing, we see this used a lot more across sort of frontline workers, where as part of tasks and planner and to do, an organisation can have a task publishing feature that pushes out across um, all of the various tasks in planner and it goes to everyone's planner. Now, when you do a priority set to urgent, what it will do is it will give in terms of the team's activity feed, it will give them the notification informing them of an urgent task right across all of the planners as you push out a task in terms of a published list. So if you're not familiar with, you know, task publishing and publish lists and dealing with it, that is very much a frontline type feature if you haven't dealt with it before. It doesn't affect, though, users creating their urgent tasks in planner, something that's a little different. So if you're not sure or how to, there are some instructions in terms of publishing tasks. Okay. Stream has had some updates. There is now a variable play speed, variable speed playback. It's a bit of a tongue twister for me. So you can actually take it up slower or faster flowing through. So I do like the um, features from the classic stream. We're starting to see more and more flowing in. Analytics in the Streams web app. So if you are online, it will start to give you things like your total views and viewers, and it also will overlay um, the viewer retention. So then that way you can kind of know well, where are people dropping off on the video over you know a short period of time, whether it's seven days right through to 90 days. So some good analytics flowing in. 
You can also search in the Stream Web app now. So you can come in, do a bit of a search so it will bring it up. Just enter those keywords into the transcript search bar and it will start to jump to. And you can then click on any of the results and it will actually play from that section in the video. So in terms of SharePoint, there's some improved page authoring experience flowing in in terms of the layout options. So we're seeing some functionality flowing through and in terms of it's dropping down. So it's also um, as part of the, uh, the, the web experience, depending on the um, uh, web app that you're dropping in and where it's going to sit, when we go in and we start to work and we're dropping in things like those toolbar parts and layout shops, we've got stuff like quick links, events, people, um, title regions. It's moving the ad section. So you'll see it's got a um, banner up the top here. So it's got this consolidated enhanced, you know, part toolbar coming in and where you're actually adding it from. And then now you've got other text overlay functionality, which I do like. It's like, where does that text overlay actually sit? It's size and styling and the color and the transparency, like, yay. <laughs> you know, it's always really difficult because your overlay was just sort of stuck in one spot and you had to sort of deal with it and choose a picture that would work for the text rather than choosing a text position that worked with the picture. So seeing those changes. Where we can create pages and news is allowing now from the SharePoint app bar. So they'll be able to select the create command directly from that bar over on the left and you can start to then drop in things that you want to have. So we're creating directly from here. Whether that happens to be, do you know, a list or office files or anything like that, you'll now be able to create direct from that app bar. And that's coming out soon. There are three new SharePoint site templates coming in. The SharePoint templates are the org home site template. So if you are getting ready or you're starting to build your SharePoint site and you want to have a template, it's got some great pre-built ones that you could just drop in. There's also a brand central template. So if you're trying to create a SharePoint site to help your organization around branding, there's some pre-built ones there that you could just then, you know, build on. Another one is accounts payable template. That accounts payable template, a drop in, and it also helps with the Microsoft uh, SharePoint syntax as well. So it's got some other stuff and flow through and some education components to be able to support you in building those new templates. In SharePoint, the renaming file viewer web part. So the file viewer web part um, was a little bit of a naming misnomer because it was actually media as well. So people wouldn't know. They kind of look at it and go, OK, it's about files. Uh, but they may not have thought about it in terms of media. So it's now more inclusive with its naming convention so that it includes things like the video types as well. There is a new list templates. Uh, sorry, there is existing templates that we've got in lists, but now it will include approvals as a part of it. So we've got then a travel request with approvals and content schedule with approvals. So they are two new ones with approvals that have come into play. So it's like the original, but it's a new one, but with an approval flow. If you have turned off automate, you're going to have a problem. It has, it will have some issues. You do need to have automation turned on because an approval flow does require having um, automate. And it may be that you tell your organisation if you need this particular one and approvals, tell us and we can then turn on approvals. Hello, Hello. someone asking a question? No, all oh, good. Okay. Updating the look and feel of OneDrive. It's not a massive change, but as part of the new fluid set, there's some small set of visual updates. So for files, for example, it's just kind of spreading files out a little bit more for the design in terms of the page that you see. You see it's just 
spreading out just that little bit more and it's lighter in its colour, it's to be able to help with things like touch and all sorts of things. Um, over on the right-hand side in terms of the ribbon that runs up the top, the info button is actually now, instead of an I, it actually is going to say info as well. So it will just stretch out a little bit more. Also in OneDrive, there was a recent update to the OneDrive settings. So if you went into the OneDrive, it did make some changes. They are, we just say they're revoking some of them, probably, because in the past, you know, there was a few features with toggles there um, and people were turning things off and it was causing some issues. They are no longer going to be able to see the Office File Collaboration settings unless um, you know, controlled by admin policy or if they had previously disabled it. So if you've gone in and disabled it, it won't be there. But there were some of these core features that came into play that then was causing issues for end users. So that is now going to be off again, effectively, unless your organisation wants to turn these features on again. So it's kind of a put it on and revoking it. In terms of what's new to Diva, I did say I would have in here the um, um, uh, blog piece by Andrea. So she's, you know, see right here, Andrea. She's put a blog out recently in March. I do particularly like it. This is just the start of it. Um, it's around working with Viva and what are some of the business values in terms of working with Viva. Um, it's quite, it, it, can, it is a little long. You can listen to it as well if you wish to. I do like it though, it's got some great information in there. Some improvements to at mentioning behaviour when it comes to Viva Engage. So you can come in, at mention someone just using their first name or last name. So these are available across the web or on mobile. In terms of what's coming to Office, in the Office app, literally on the web, when you go to create a PDF now, the original document, whether it's Word or Excel or PowerPoint, when you're creating that file and you go create a PDF off the back of it, it will inherit those source file sensitivity labels. So it will do that now by default so that it will apply it to the PDF for you. Um, if you have a document that's got encryption, it can't automatically be converted to a PDF without removing that protection first, by the way. So that's coming out for the more May to June. The new message recall and exchange online is rolling out now. Actually, I think that one is from last month. My apologies, I removed that one from the presentation. Okay. What's new to Excel? The few ones that I particularly like that were flowing in was the formula argument assistance. So as part of that formula, it will then do its drop down and explain things really quickly and easily out in the past you had to kind of go in and physically open up the assistance and it would be in its other window now it's going to have there immediately as part of the drop down to help and support i like that one we have been waiting and the modern uh, modern commenting team had spoken to us some time ago and had got opinions around doing assigning of a task with at mentions. We've seen it flow into Microsoft Teams. We've seen it flow into the browser, but is now coming across the board to Office on your desktop application. Yay! Assign a task and it will all flow through. And the fact that it then all flows through into to do is always a big win for me when we are assigning a task of at mentioning. So all part of that modern commenting. It's taken a little while to hit the desktop, considering we spoke with them I think it would be a year and a half ago. Uh, it's finally here to the desktop. Uh, just to close out, conscious of time, we've still got 10 minutes finishing a little early today. And um, there is some great events now. The Digital Workplace Conference has moved. It was originally going to be a little earlier in June. It's pushed out now to the 2nd to the 3rd of August. So you can come in on the early bird and um, get a savings of $385 if you want to register. It is going to be held in Melbourne at the Sofitel. Viva Summit is coming up. We're about to hit on the Thursday 
the 20th is the Microsoft MVP conference. We've got that coming up very soon. At the same time, we've got the Microsoft Viva Summit. The Viva Summit is actually available for you, um, public, to be able to come in and have a look at all things Viva. So I do recommend that. That will be running through the night because the 9, it starts at 9 a.m. That would be, I think you'll find for most of us, that will hit around about 1, 2 in the morning. Okay. Lots of conferences right around the world, should you happen to be there. Some of them are hybrid, some aren't. They're in person, but um, go have a look. The where do I find, same thing in terms of adoption support newsletter. I have put in here uh, some of the new resources so in terms of Viva Engage. I've like dropped in the Viva Engage adoption guide and I'll always try and sort of put in some new things that will be able to help you and keep an eye out on the links. Okay. The where do I find, I have, uh, I have dropped in, where is it? I have dropped in the new Insider there's always lots of great new content that's coming out that sits in the Insider channel. One in particular was OneNote and doing notes with OneNote, some new features and functionality on the Insider. I'd really recommend having a look. It might be a little while till it hits us, and I'll talk about that one a little bit later, but um, it's, a, it's a new one that I do like. We do have our user groups right around sort of ANZ, different ones to be able to help and support you. I have put up the um, last session, which was the Teams Premium. That's what we did last month. So it's there and it's available on YouTube for you. What's next? So next month, we actually have Corey Banks from Microsoft. He's the behavioral architect. He's going to be coming in from the ACM team. He's going to talk about some of that hidden change. That's transitioning the IT operations to be able to support our um, business from a help desk sort of perspective. And as change specialists, I know that in the programs I do, I'm regularly supporting to ensure that the IT team are also ready for all of the change. We need to not forget that they are an important part of our change journey. So we'll have Corey coming in and speaking in regards to that. So anyone have any thoughts, comments, questions? If there's anything in particular um, you want to ask about, then please feel free to hit me up. You can raise your hand. If there aren't any questions. No, the looks of it. Hopefully you've enjoyed the session today. And, uh, you know, I appreciate Andrea, you know, coming in and having a chat with us and uh, hopefully you like some of the what's new. Don't forget the presentation is available for you and you can come back in and have a look at all of the different links and features at your leisure because there's certainly always plenty in there to um, go and play. I will get Andrea's presentation for you. I'll drop it in. And the moment I have it live up on YouTube, I will put it into chat. It'll also be on Meetup and I push it out across um, Twitter and LinkedIn. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you will should hopefully receive all of that. Okay. So, yes, it's always available, and there you go. Okay. You're very welcome, Mel. It's um, it's certainly uh, – I'm feeling a little tired today. I went till way too late last night at midnight. I, I said, it's time to go to sleep, and um, crawled into bed, but your head's still firing with all of the information. Sometimes there's some cool stuff. It's like, how can you apply this? <laughs> uh, okay, thanks all, and I will uh, see you all next month.